Good morning and welcome. Good to see you all. And a particular welcome to John from Grace. So many thanks, John, for joining us. And uh, we continue to give many thanks to Grace for all the support that the church has given us. So thank you. Uh, a few notices. Um, quite a number of uh, people not well at the moment. So please do continue to support our brothers and sisters who have got ill health. Um, I know it's always difficult when you mention one or two people and then you feel as though you've left other people out, but please do uh, pray for Steve and Maggie, uh, who are very much struggling at the moment, and um, please uphold them in your prayers. Uh, other topics for prayer, uh, LZ7 and Illuminate, they've uh, had the school visits, they've had the concerts, and now it's the follow-up. So uh, please continue to to pray for uh, everything that's happening with the youngsters there and uh, pray that there'll be people locally within Sharnbrook who, who would like some support and like to learn more and uh, pray for, for Sam's involvement in that. Also please uh, continue to pray for Sam as she uh, prepares for going into the primary school to lead the RE lessons uh, in, in just over a week's time. So uh, let's remember that. Very important for the children to get a good Christian input, and uh, great that Sam's got that opportunity. Uh, Easter services, uh, as you can see on the board, uh, quite a lot going on in the, in the next uh, week or two. Uh, next Sunday, Palm Sunday, uh, we've got um, a prayer and praise meeting here at four o'clock, uh, so please remember that. Uh, do come along if you can. During the morning service, uh, Miles and I will be providing a little bit of an update uh, you'll recall that we, we had the survey to, to find out how everybody was feeling about the way forward. Uh, <coughs> and uh, because of Miles' travel and business uh, dealings, um, we've not really had the chance to get together and, and discuss it and therefore the chance for feedback. But next Sunday we will be. That will be uh, Sunday morning. Good Friday on the 29th. Uh, there's, obviously we've got the communion service as always, the walk to the green and then at 10 o'clock at the Village Green. Uh, Miles will be leading those services on Good Friday, uh, so please continue to pray for Miles. Saturday, there's a Fellowship Easter walk starting in Pavenham, and then obviously Easter Sunday, we're back here. So plenty to pray for there, and if you feel there's an opportunity there during any of those events to invite people who might uh, benefit and uh, we might have the opportunity to talk with about Jesus and please do. Okay, let's open this morning's service in prayer. Let's pray. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Holy Father God, we come to you this morning, some of us weary and burdened. Some of us struggling with ill health. Some of us with so many worries. Some of us with just too much to do. Some of us burdened for our friends and families. Some of us weighed down by sin and temptation. Many of us distracted by the things of this world. Dear Lord Jesus Christ, help us to lay down these burdens at the foot of your cross this morning. May we learn afresh the joy of taking upon our shoulders your yoke and learning from you. May we know anew how gentle you are with us. And may we find rest for our souls. Amen. Amen. Jeremy. In Philippians, we're told 
Jesus humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on the cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Let's praise him now as we sing the next two songs, and then there will be the opportunity for short prayers or praise. Oh, 
Jesus to come and sort out the mess that human beings have made and provide a way for us to find our way back to you, Lord. And we thank you that all we've asked is that we reach out and believe in you and accept you as our Lord and Saviour. Turn away from our sins. Thank you, Lord, that we can do that. Thank you that you provided a free gift to us, but it wasn't We thank you, Lord God, for the opportunity this morning of worship, for the freedom to be amongst your family here, our family. We thank you that we can come and meet together in your house, even though it's just a schoolroom, that we know you meet with us here, as you meet with us through every day. Thank you for the warmth of your embrace that we feel in a special way when we gather together with friends who we know, know you. Thank you that in worship, we can put aside the uncertainties of this world and rest upon the certainties of your kingdom. For your promises that are not changeable as those of the politicians we hear of every day on our television screen, but your promises which are immovable and eternal Thank you that we can bring to your feet all the hurts and fears that trouble us and leave them there, knowing that your strength and your assurance are all that we require for this day ahead and indeed for our life ahead. Thank you that as we draw near you in worship, we are transported from a world of concerns and fears to a place where we can be at peace in your presence, find healing, wholeness, and refreshment, a foretaste of that wonderful eternity that we will have, 
when we worship with the multitude from all nations before your throne. Lord God, we marvel at the wonder of the incarnation of your Son, that he walked in this fallen and broken world in which we inhabit, that he wept for Jerusalem as he entered the city that last time, the man of sorrow, the ultimate model of empathy and compassion for a broken world. God of love, God of peace, this fractured world call, cries out in pain. May we be challenged by your love to seek to make a difference in your world around us. As we witness to the love you have shown us on the cross, soften our hearts that are so often stone-like, <clears throat> create in us a heart for the people around about us to respond to your call to witness to others about your power to change hearts just as you've changed ours and bring new beginnings just as you've brought new beginnings to ours to change this world one heart at a time and we pray for our world and for our fellowship we pray for those who are ill or in pain we've already thought of Steve and Maggie who've had a particularly difficult week. We pray for Bernard and Alison amongst us this morning who quietly strive on with you by their sides. For Stella uh, in pain at home. We pray for those who grieve because of bereavement or perhaps because loved ones in need live so very far away from their care. Pray for those who can't be regularly with us, who in the past have been here so faithfully every morning and been at the heart of our fellowship. For folk like Ruth Register, for Stella again, and for the Defees. We pray especially this morning for Erba and Simon, as they've suffered so much in these last few weeks. May you be a comfort to them. And we thank you for folk like John and the rest of his brothers at Grace who are so graciously supporting us at this time. We thank you for the opportunities to get involved with things like this LZ7 Illuminate mission. For the hope that it brings to see packed concerts of young people and the strong response in the first follow-up meeting for news of some 400 young folk accessing the app through which they can follow up. And we pray above all for a stirring of hearts in the young people that within this building where we worship you every Sunday morning, there might be established in the academy a worshiping community of young folk. We pray for our own children's work here on a Sunday morning and through the week with Uncover. We thank you for this exciting box events at Grace Community Church that our young folk are going along to. Pray that that might be a great part in them being discipled by you for their lives ahead as so many of them think to leave for new educational opportunities. And for the young in the community through the JC Club and the Easter events, we pray that you'll bless Sam in all that she does to reach out to those young folk. For a world torn by war and famine and drought that we see on our television screens and in our communities. For the fractures of the fall that we see in our society. We can but pray for our leaders internationally, nationally and locally as they seek to navigate their chal these challenges. Lord, bring them wisdom, direction and dare we pray bring to them a faith in you. For all the many places that we serve as a congregation, as we go from here back home to work and to community, we pray that you might help us to shine for you. So often we admit that we shine despite ourselves rather than because of ourselves. Lord, 
confront a simplicity of faith and a generosity of witness and service that gives without counting cost. Give us a life overflowing with the grace poured out from a Lord Jesus who gave everything for us, that we might show the power of love to broken people in our broken world. Lord, grant us the words, the actions, the courage, the yearning, even this week, to share your gospel of truth and to live a humble life of faith that draws our neighbours towards you. Amen. Thank you, Miles, for leading us in our prayers. Sam, can you continue to do the talk? Well, this morning we are thinking about Jesus and some of the things that he says to people. Um, and he poses this question. He says, why do you call me Lord? Why do you say I'm your king and then not follow me? It's like giving your mums a card, say on Mother's Day last week, saying, Mum, I'm really grateful for everything that you do for me and then later on shouting at her because you can't have your own way. Jesus says we can either be wise or foolish, and I'm guessing I, that we all know what it's like to be foolish. Now, first slide next, Mark. This is the weather forecast for today. Uh, so we know that it's been very wet. Now, Eleanor, will you come and help me? I wonder if this is a wise or foolish thing to do, Eleanor. We've seen that it's been raining this morning, haven't we? So come here, come and help me. I think, because it's been raining, you better get dressed up in some wet weather gear. Yeah? You all right, can you wear these trousers? <laughs> yeah, try them on. It's too big. Too big? Should we ask someone else? Should we ask someone else? Rob, come on. Come on. <laughs> He's not going to fit in the wellies though, is he? Come on, Rob, come and get some wet weather gear on. And um, even though we can see the forecast there, I think we'd better be prepared. So I've bought you some gloves. Are you going to be able to get in those? Oh, no, I didn't. There we go, you won't be able to wear the wellies, but you can certainly wear the trousers. <laughs> <laughs> well done. We'd better be prepared. Gloves. You definitely can't wear the wellies, so you better put your shoes back on. Coat. Yeah, get pressed up. You never know what's going to happen. I mean, I know that says that it's sunny and everything, but you just never know. So, do <coughs> you think this is wise or foolish? What do we think? <laughs> well, I don't know, wise or foolish. Um, this afternoon, if Rob's <coughs> like that and the forecast is right, what's he going to look like? <laughs> He's going to look like a fool, isn't he? Oh, I've got your hat, there you go. <laughs> um, thanks, Rob, you can go and sit down. <laughs> <laughs> well, what does it mean to be foolish? What does it mean to be wise? What about if we work very, very hard? What if we say the right things to the right people? What if we eat with impeccable manners at the dinner table? Is that being wise? Jesus tells a different story. Let's have the next slide. Thanks, Mark. Jesus says, everyone who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice is like a man building a house who laid the foundation on a rock. Next slide, thanks, Mark. When the floods came, the torrent struck that house it was not shaken because it was well built. Next slide, thanks, Mark. But the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like a man who built without foundation. The torrent struck, it collapsed, and its destruction was complete. So what does Jesus say it means to be wise? Well, to be wise, it's one who hears my words and puts them into practice. So better than dressing up for the weather when we look at the forecast, perhaps being wise 
is dressing up for Jesus. <coughs> dressing up with truth, with faith and righteousness, with peace, with asking the Spirit to be in our lives and remembering salvation. And then we can be with those who were listening to Jesus and putting his words into practice. So I wonder whether we're going to be wise or foolish today, but let's ask God to help us be wise. Dear God, we thank you that your son Jesus came to teach us what it means to be truly wise, to listen to you and to put your words into practice. And so we ask, Lord, that you would help us to do that. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Rob. <laughs> uh, before Simon comes to do our reading for us, we've got a couple more songs. morning's Bible reading is from Luke's Gospel, chapter 6, beginning to read at verse 37. If you want to follow this in one of the church Bibles, it can be found on page 1034. So Luke 6, beginning at verse 37. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be poured into your lap. 
for with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. He also told them this parable. Can a blind man lead a blind man? Will they not both fall into a pit? A student is not above his teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like his teacher. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, Brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when you yourself fail to see the plank in your own eye? You hypocrite! First take the plank out of your eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. No good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Each tree is recognised by its own fruit. People do not pick figs from thorn bushes or grapes from briars. The good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart and the evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For out of the overflow of his heart, his mouth speaks. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? I will show you what he is like who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice. He is like a man building a house who dug down deep and laid the foundation on a rock. When the flood came, the torrent struck that house but could not shake it because it was well built. But the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. The moment the torrent struck that house, it collapsed and its destruction was complete. We give thanks to God for his word. Fantastic. Uh... Thank you so much for the reading. That's great. Um, if you've uh, got if you've got a Bible, thank you very much. That's very helpful. Uh, if you do have a Bible or something like that with a passage on it, do uh, keep hold of it. We'll be uh, using that in the next few minutes. But let me pray before we we dig into God's word together. Uh, Heavenly Father, thank you so much that we have Jesus' words here for us this morning. And Father, as we uh, spend time together now, uh, dwelling. Uh, with him, uh, on them, Father, please, by your spirit, move in our hearts and uh, change us more and more into his likeness. Uh, please meet us this morning, in Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, um, I've got here a picture of, uh, it, it was a post that caught my eye about extraordinary churches. Uh, this is a church in uh, Italy, and said, so this is an extraordinary church. Uh, this is another one. Let's see if I've got the hang of this. Brilliant. This is a monastery in Greece. It's an extraordinary uh, church, the post said. And this is the final one, maybe one of the most famous. Some of you uh, will have seen this before. It's uh, of the, uh, the church, this church of Ethiopia. It's, it's hewn into the side of the cliff. If you want a close-up of where the, uh, the, the church is, it's there. To get to that church, uh, you need to climb the cliff to get there. It's an extraordinary church, or at least that's what the post said. Uh, it's an extraordinary church. Now, I wonder if you ask people, your friends at work, whatever, what do you think is an extraordinary church? I wonder if they say something similar. They think about the building. They think about St. Paul's Cathedral, uh, York Minster, something like that. That's extraordinary, isn't it? And then, you know, you might have some friends who may be a bit more clued up, say, well, actually, it's not the building, it's the people. And we say, yeah, it is. And they say, well, an extraordinary church, then, is a big church. It's one with loads and loads of members. Of, you know, the American kind of 10,000 people uh, megachurch. That's an extraordinary church. Or maybe they talk about the, the production. Like, it's, the church has laser shows, and the worship is out of this world. And that's an extraordinary church. I think what we're going to see, hopefully this morning, is actually what makes an extraordinary church is a church of ordinary people following an extraordinary God who's doing extraordinary things in their hearts. That's an extraordinary church. Uh, an extraordinary churches have big hearts. That's the big idea this morning. Extraordinary churches have big hearts. Uh, and the reason why that's extraordinary is because of what's ordinary in our world, isn't it? Uh, we're living in a time which is at both, on one hand, judgmental, and on another hand, defensive. 
Uh, you only have to uh, flick on your news feed and you'll see just how judgmental people are. You may have experienced some of that. People are very quick to point the finger, uh, to call each other out on uh, one uh, misdeed or indiscretion or another. People are very judgmental. But at the same time, people are very defensive. Uh, people are very quick to, to put up the wall and say, look, no, I'm doing this thing my way. You've got no right to speak to me about what I am doing. That's the ordinary kind of mood of where we are. Now, this episode in Jesus' life follows on uh, from last week. And this verse particularly, Jesus has been talking to his followers, particularly about how to relate to people outside the church, maybe people who even uh, are enemies. And it finishes on verse 36 of chapter 6, where he says, Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. See, the, uh, the, the character of the God we follow shapes the people we are. Be merciful as your heavenly Father is <coughs> merciful. And now uh, the, the passage we've got this morning is all about how are God's people then meant to live with each other? Uh, we've thought about people, how we're meant to relate to people outside, how we're meant to live brother and sister in God's family. And that's important because I'm not going to ask you to put your hands up, but let me ask you a question. Have you ever been annoyed by another Christian? Don't put your hands up. Um, have you ever been let down by another Christian? Have you ever been hurt by another Christian? I think we've all experienced these things, haven't we? Uh, so we're going to need Jesus' words to help us know how to deal with that. How do we live together when we sin and what difference does Jesus make? And we start with a bit of a warning, really. And it's this, small hearts are judgy. Uh, small hearts are judgy. In fact, the, the word people used to use is judgmental. Uh, but um, the word that's come to supplant that is judgy. Small hearts are judgy. In fact, this verse, verse 37, I think this one might be the most famous verse in the Bible. Now, it's got a few competitors. Uh, John 3.16 that's probably one of the most famous verses, but think how many times you've heard people quote this verse. And as I heard one commentator say, it's almost in the old-fashioned translation, judge not, lest ye be judged. Uh, You'll have heard that all over the place, I imagine. Uh, people know this verse because it, it captures something of our atmosphere in the world we live. People say it when they feel guilty because they've been caught some, doing something wrong and they want to kind of dodge it. Don't judge me or you'll be judged. Uh, people also use it, don't they, when they feel defiant and they don't want anyone else to speak into their lives. What is it to be judgy? What is this? Do not judge, do not condemn, verse 37. Uh, and it's this idea, isn't it, of having a... A critical spirit, uh, an inclination, a, an appetite to criticise someone else. It's where you, um, you're you quick to um, think a bad motive of someone else's actions. You, it's sort of, you have an imaginary kind of, why did they do that? Well, it must have been really bad. That's one way of being, having a critical spirit. But having a critical spirit, being judgy, it turns mistakes into sin. You know, someone could be acting in ignorance, they could be unaware of something, but a critical spirit turns that mistake into grave sin. A critical spirit refuses to allow or enable someone to correct themselves or to make amends. It's the opposite of big-hearted. Uh, the, there's a word um, that people don't use very much anymore, magnanimous. You may have heard this word magnanimous. It means big heart, giant spirit. Uh, that's, it's the opposite of that. Uh, Winston Churchill, who, who I know is not without his flaws or, or problems, but in the aftermath of World War I, he was dining with the Prime Minister, uh, and one of the secretaries was watching, and the mood at the time was on seeing Germany in post-First World War collapse was to let them suffer. They've done all this wrong, they've caused all this suffering, let them suffer. 
But Churchill countered that actually Britain should immediately send over ships with provisions. He spoke of the great qualities of the people and the, their honour uh, and the necessity of them being part of the rebuilding of Europe. <coughs> he recalled that, it, that his mood was divided between anxiety of the future and desire to help the fallen foe. Later, the secretary recorded, Lloyd George wants to shoot the Kaiser, Winston does not. And it's exactly that desire to help the fallen foe, which is that sort of magnanimity, big spirit, not to rush in with condemnation, but to give charity and mercy. That's the opposite of being judgy. Why do we, why do, why do, we do it? Because I've done it. Uh, I can admit that. I, I, I know that tendency of myself. I think we do it when we see in others a flaw that I know I'm guilty of. Okay? And I think it's a way of cle cleansing my own conscience. Uh, I see something that I know I'm guilty of in someone else, and if I rush in there on them, I cannot think about my own failings in that area. Sometimes it's the reverse. Sometimes I see a weakness in someone else where I'm strong. And I'm all proud of myself for how good I am at this thing when they're <coughs> weak at it. Forgetting, of course, that it's only by God's grace that I have that bit of my life sorted. It's judginess, judgy, judgmentalism. And I think it's a way of building our own self-esteem. If I can put you down, I rise up by comparison. Uh, in the, the third Lord of the Rings movie, um, there's a, a, just an awkward, awful moment, um, awful because it's bad filmmaking, I think, uh, where they're discussing their tactics, and they're laying it all out, and then Legolas, I think for the benefit of anyone who's not been paying attention in the cinema, says, ah, a diversion. Uh, you're, oh, thank you, we haven't got it. But that's often what judgmentalism is. It's a diversion, away from my own flaws, so I can focus on someone else's. And there's a problem. Look again at verses 37 and 38. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. And then by contrast, forgive and you will be forgiven. Give and it will be given to you. A good measure pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be poured into your lap. For the measure you use, it will be measured to you. You see, if we're judgy, if we embrace that critical spirit, it's a warning sign that we ourselves have not received grace. It's not what Jesus does. Do you see how he describes it in verse 39 and 40? He says, look, are you following me? Am I your teacher? Because if you're following me and I'm your teacher, this is what I'm like. I'm gracious. I'm merciful. And if you're following me, that's how you've got to be too. Otherwise, you're going to be the blind following the blind. It's wrong because it also puts us in God's place, doesn't it? God is the only one who can legitimately judge us without any, um, without any flaw or defect in himself. And there's a consequence. Look, for the measure you use, it will be measured to you. I can... Can you imagine a church community... That's governed by a critical spirit. It's not going to stay a church community, is it, for very long. Uh, people in dating talk about red flags. Uh, oh, he didn't pay for the meal. That's a red flag. I'm not, not, not pursuing a relationship with him. Oh, she talks about her mum too much. That's a red flag. I'm not going out with him. Do you know what I mean? People have these red flags. If we as Christians are judgy, it's a red flag. It's a massive red flag. Something is deeply unhealthy in us. So we need to examine our own hearts. Do you know, these, these are the symptoms that we are being judged, that we have a critical spirit. One, we're quick to criticise. Two, we're slow to forgive. Three, we're quick to reach a conclusion about someone else and why they did something. And four, we have a small sense of proportion. 
We take a small error and make it a massive deal. Now, obviously, these words are challenging, aren't they? They're challenge, they challenge me uh, and my instinct, uh, my selfish instincts. But there's also wonderful assurance here. For the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. There is forgiveness for a judgy spirit with Jesus. But small hearts are judging. Uh, by contrast, big hearts are judging. This is the amazing um, irony in this ver these verses. Uh, this isn't against all judging. It's against being judgy. It's about having the judgmental, the critical spirit. But big hearts are judging. You see that because as you read Jesus' words, as we, we hear them now, we see that Christians are expected to be able to judge between right and wrong. In fact, these verses about the, uh, the speck and the plank are all about actually being able to see something wrong in someone else's life. In verse 43, he talks about being able to distinguish between good and bad fruit. In fact, that's one of the consequences of following Jesus' teacher, verse 40. You will be fully trained like their teacher. Fully trained means restored. It means full. So actually big hearts, hearts that know Jesus, are judging hearts. But they start with themselves first. Big hearts start with themselves first. You see, the heart is where all the action happens in verse 45. That's the point of that parable about the fruit. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. It mentions good three times there. An evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored in his heart. Good, 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 heart. Evil, 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 heart. The heart is where the battle is. Uh, a few years ago, and I think the effects are still ongoing, uh, the water source in a place called Flint, Michigan, got polluted. There was a film about it, it's a big scandal, uh, and um, it meant that because the, the, the source got corrupted, I think it was with lead, uh, lead poisoning, um, what came out of the taps was nothing but toxic. Uh, nothing but toxic. And that's a, a picture of the heart. What's the heart like? Big hearts are judging hearts, but they judge themselves first. In Romans, what does Paul say? By the measure of grace given to you, think not of yourself more highly <laughs> than you are, you are, but instead, think of yourself with sober judgment. Sober judgment. It's, it's God's grace. It's receiving God's grace that enables us to stop and self examine. The, uh, the, the story, Jesus uh, turns a little bit comedian here, doesn't he, with the story of the speck and the plank? In fact, I don't think even these words do it justice. What we're really talking about is that um, it's a beam that holds up a house. Uh, and you, you kind of picture someone with an RSJ sticking out of their eye, walking down the street somehow, and spotting a, a splinter, a speck in someone's eye, and saying, oh, I think you've got a problem there. Uh, let me help you. That's the effect. That's what Jesus is talking about. That's the, the ridiculousness of the judgmental spirit. But the point is, not that we are, are never to correct each other, the point is that we start with ourselves first. The, 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 we start with that self-examination. So that's, and that's the way we avoid the hypocrisy that he speaks of. By the grace given to you. What's our teacher like? Jesus. He's big-hearted, isn't he? he? He's great of spirit. When he's on the cross being crucified for the sins of the world, for the sins of the people in front of him who are crucifying him, and he's facing the darkness. He says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That's big hearted. Uh, in Galatians 6 uh, and uh, verse 1, Paul writes, Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves, or you may also be tempted. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks they are something when they are not, they deceive themselves. Each one 
should test their own actions. Now, big hearts are judging hearts, but they're, they start with themselves. Uh, and they take themselves to Jesus. Now, some of you will remember those heady day, school days of playing rounders. Um, some of you even, I don't know, maybe baseball fans. But you know what you do, don't you? If you hit the ball, where do you go first? You have to go to first base. You can't hit the ball and immediately go to the fourth. <clears throat> or in baseball, come back to the home plate. You have to go there first. And Jesus said, look, that's what big hearts do. They go to themselves first. And they go to Jesus with, the, with what they see there. So how are we people who are meant to judge well, judge with big hearts? I think uh, these are sort of five tips that came uh, up to me. Firstly, we judge humbly. Now, can I say the best way to humble yourself is through regular confession? By coming to Jesus and, and searching yourselves and going, Jesus, what isn't right in my life? Uh, let me shine your light into my darkness. Because when we do that, we realise that we can't pretend that we have no problems. We realise that we're not that person. We realise when we regularly confess that, how can I put it? <laughs> the main problem isn't them, it's me. And when we're regularly confessing, we realise that actually, it's not that their problem is a big one and my problem is a small one, it's just the other way around. Uh, that's what regular confession does. Uh, we do it prayerfully, uh, speaking to God and, and throwing open the corners of our lives to Him. Uh, we, we correct biblically. Now, I think this is an important thing, because over the years, one of the things that has led to a judgmental spirit, a critical spirit, is when people have tried to correct each other strongly on things where people can disagree. So in Romans 14 and 15, Paul is talking about the differences of, of opinion that can exist between Christians. And just, don't worry, that's okay. But where there's a, a, a black and white issue of biblical truth, that's where we can be more confident, isn't it, in correcting one another. We do so lovingly. What is love? Remember, it's not so much a feeling, it's that desire to do the very best, the very best possible for that other person. It's not about making me feel better about myself, it's not about being some sort of truth warrior, it's because I love that person, I want to see them the best they possibly could be with Jesus. And mercifully, not treating someone as we think they deserve, they said that so they need to be corrected, they need justice. No, they need mercy, just like I do. Uh, one uh, final thing before we move on to the third kind of big idea this morning. And uh, I think it's, uh, it's, 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 blink and you miss it. Verse 45, for the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Oh my goodness. Mm. How, how damning. <laughs> just think, what, what sort of speech are you known for? Are you known to be a gentle, encouraging, uh, uplifting talker? Or are you somebody who loves to say it how it is, call a spade a spade? Well, there's a place for directness, isn't there? But just be careful. What comes out of the mouth isn't a small deal. Say, oh, I just, it's just something I say, I don't really mean it. But you said it. Jesus says, for the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Uh, for me, I think it's a corrective for those cultures we find ourselves in, which are very full of banter and that kind of thing. Banter could be a lovely leveller, a, 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 humi a, a humbling thing, but it can also be a dangerous thing. <laughs> Many a true word spoken in jest. Big hearts are judging hearts. Uh, and finally this, Jesus is the one who changes hearts, ultimately, isn't he? Uh, that's where we land in, the, in the, the picture, the parable and the foundation. Jesus is the one who will change hearts. As much as we would like to do it ourselves, it's actually where you build determines what will last. And we've talked, haven't we? Jesus had a big heart. Uh, Jesus is big hearted. He's great of spirit. Someone that used this phrase, uh, he remembers to forget. I love that. He remembers to forget. Uh, he says he will remember their sins no more. Uh, wow, that's an amazing thing to aspire to, isn't it? As we're living with each other, as we upset each other sometimes, an extraordinary church has a big heart 
where people remember to forgive. Uh, Jesus was quick to forgive. He didn't bring revenge. He came, he, he was seeking restoration. And he didn't come and walk the earth for three years to hurt people, but to rescue people. Now there will come a time where there is that judgment that comes, and we'll get to that uh, as the, the passage ends. But Jesus had a big heart. And I think only when your heart, only when your heart is broken first by him, can you speak to others in any sort of corrective way. When you build, what is he saying? Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Uh, whoever comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice, I will show them what they are like. And there's a difference, isn't there, between imitation and real change. I don't know if you've got kids and they're watching sport on TV uh, and they, they maybe have heroes, sporting heroes, and they start to pick up the mannerisms of their sporting heroes uh, and they imitate them. They copy what they see. But perhaps, perhaps it's not until they actually get on a sports field or a gymnasium and they do the sport that they actually start to walk the walk. And we can't just look at Jesus and attempt to copy him. We have to walk with him. Uh, otherwise there'll be no change. He won't change our hearts if we're not walking with him. And I think what Jesus is saying here is you're most likely to be judgy when the pressure's on, when the torrent strikes. What will leak out of your heart? Well, it depends where you're building. If you're walking with Jesus, when the pressure's on, then God's grace will leak out. Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. When the pressure's on, do those things leak out of you? They will, by God's grace, if you're building with Jesus. Uh, there's an amazing story. Um, in the, uh, t- the conflict between Turkey and Armenia, a Turkish officer went in and they raided and looted a Turkish home. Uh, the Turkish officer, he killed the parents and he gave the daughters to the soldiers, keeping the eldest for himself. Uh, she later escaped. She trained as a nurse. And as time passed, she found herself nursing on a ward of Turkish officers. One night, by the light of the lantern, she saw the face of this officer who had tormented her. He was so great, gravely ill that without exceptional nursing, he would die. And the days passed and he recovered. One day the doctor stood by the bed and uh, uh, with the nurse and said to the officer, but for her devotion, you would be dead. He looked at her and said, we've met before, haven't we? Yes, she said, we have met before. Why didn't you kill me? He asked. She replied, I am a follower of him who says, love your enemies. So if you're building with Jesus when the pressure's on, then love will leak out. That's what makes an ordinary church extraordinary. Big hearts changed by Jesus. Putting in foundation is no small thing. Jesus uses uh, present continuous verbs, if you're interested. Uh, He says, come here, build. He's coming. Those who are coming to me, hearing me, building with me. If you've had a built extension in Bedfordshire uh, and the, the clay soil, it's hard work, isn't it? It's hard, bunching work to build those foundations deep. Uh, It takes work to build with Jesus. We're saved by grace, uh, we go on by grace, but to get to know him, we need to keep coming to him. And then when we receive from him, we get a big heart. We're able to forgive, not condemn. We're able to give and not judge. Jesus, he he gives us the grace of salvation. He gives us the grace by which we may obey. And change, for me, over the years, is always gradual and painful. And it's three steps forward and two steps back. Uh, But it's always by God's grace, by walking with him. And ultimately, there's that future assurance too, isn't there? That those who build their lives with Jesus, when the torrent comes, won't be disappointed. The, the preacher, Scottish preacher, Arthur John Gossett, which is the best name ever, um, he lost his wife untimely, early. And on the Sunday when he returned to the pulpit, he said these words, uh, I don't think we need to be afraid of life. Our hearts are very frail, 
and there are places where the road is very street, steep and very lonely. But we have a wonderful God, and as Paul puts it, what can separate us from his love? Not death, he says, immediately pushing that aside at once as the most obvious of all impossibilities. No, not death, for I, standing here in the roaring of the Jordan, cold to the heart, with its dreadful chill and very conscience of the terror of its rushing, I can call back to you who one day in your time will have to cross it. Be of God good cheer, my friend, for I feel the bottom and it is sound. What is an extraordinary church? An extraordinary church is a big-hearted church. And although we saw those amazing pictures of places hewn into rocks and things like that, actually, um, an extraordinary church, if I could... Uh, you know, take a picture of you sitting here this morning and put it up there. A church touched by Jesus with big hearts, a local church anywhere, can be an extraordinary church if it is a big-hearted church because it knows Jesus has the biggest hearts and has done the most for them. Uh, why don't I uh, close by praying and then we'll uh, sing our final song together. Our Heavenly Father, we want to thank you so much that you do not treat us as we deserve, that you extend grace and mercy to us. And Father, please uh, humble us, please bring us constantly before your throne of grace, so that we might know that wonderful uh, love that covers all, and that we in turn might be those who uh, extend love likewise to those around us. Help us be forbearing with one another, quick to forgive, and slow to criticise. Uh, please guide us, shape this church family to be like your son Jesus. And we pray these, all these things in his name. Amen. 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 So together, let's, uh, we're going to stand and sing a, a final song. And it speaks, I think, of where we can find our hope. When we know, when we catch ourselves in those moments of judgmentalism, where do we find our hope? Not in making ourselves better, but in the wonderful gospel of Jesus. So let's stand and sing our final song together.
close, uh, let's remember those uh, verse, those qualities, those fruit of the Spirit that we'd love to flow from our own hearts and uh, pray for God's help as we think about the week ahead. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Father God, we thank you that Jesus embodies those things and we confess to you that we fail in so many ways in those different in those different qualities. <clears throat> Father, help us meet with you, meet with us by your spirit and change us so that we will go out into your world, into our communities, uh, embodying the sort, of, uh, the sort of person you were and are. Please help us, please guide us and be with us. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 And my guess is that there's some tea and coffee for those who wish to stay. Uh, thank you so much for your hospitality, by the way. It's been lovely to be with you. Thanks. Thanks. Many, many thanks, John. Very much appreciate it. Um, and yes, please do stay for tea and coffee. Uh, Rosemary and Simon will be serving us. And uh, unfortunately, it is Rosie, Rosemary and Simon's last Sunday with us. So uh, just want to say many thanks for being part of our fellowship. And uh, we are going to miss you. But we wish you all best for your future in your new family. <laughs>